Ladies and gentlemen, we're a few moments away from getting started with our next speaker. If you want to make your way in toward the tent, and then there's a very happy... Is it the mini? Okay, so yeah, I was just standing too close to the front of the stage. That's a huge my bad. So I'm just going to make a very quick side note before I get into this. I happen to, it wasn't eavesdropping, it's just the things you hear. And I heard our next guest say, oh yeah, and that's why I got arrested. So um, that was all I heard. It. And I'm sure it's going to be brilliant from there. But Lauren Ornelas founded Food Empowerment Project, or the FEP, which seeks to create a more just and sustainable world by recognizing the power of one's food choices. FEP encourages healthy food choices that reflect a more compassionate society by spotlighting the abuse of animals on farms, the depletion of natural resources, unfair working conditions for produce workers, and the unavailability of healthy foods in low-income areas. A fierce animal activist for over 20 years, Lauren was the first woman of color inducted into the Animal Rights Hall of Fame at the 2018 National Animal Rights. Her talk is entitled Food Justice, How Your Food Choices Can Change the World. And if you have any questions afterwards, Lauren is free to answer a few of those before the big panel discussion later. So without further ado, please welcome from California, Lauren Ornelas. Thanks so much. Thanks for everybody for being here. I wasn't going to talk about my numerous arrests, but I have been arrested over a dozen times all for the animals. Um, I want to thank Monika and the other organizers for having me here to speak. Um, I wanted to start by, um, and I want to apologize if I'm saying this wrong, but I wanted to start by recognizing whose land we are on because we are on stolen land. This is land of the indigenous um, of Canada. So the Métis and the Inuit, um, I want to honor them and recognize that this is their land that we're on and hope that we all remember that and, and um, treat them as they are, as the original, original people whose this land is. Um, so I've been doing animal rights since 1987, um, and I've been vegan for over 31 years now and pretty much decided to dedicate my life to advocating for the rights of non-human animals. Uh, but my talk today is about making connections of various issues and the importance of doing so. And I'm so used to using a PowerPoint, so I apologize that I do have notes, because <laughs> I'm just so not used to it. But basically, um, I started to Food Empowerment Project in 2007. And the reason why I started is because there was this great need to show the importance of honoring the connections of various um, issues of human rights and, and animal rights together. That it's not a one or the other. We don't have to make a decision between advocating for the rights of human beings or the non-human animals. That we can do them together. And actually it's incumbent on us if we want to advance as a society and even as a movement that we recognize this. Um, I also want to mention that this is the first time I've ever been to Calgary. Um, and because of the fact that this is the first time I've ever been to Calgary, the only knowledge I've ever had of Calgary is of the stampede, which I find to be one of the most egregious forms of animal suffering that I've ever read about. My husband, Mark Hawthorne, wrote a book called Bleeding Hearts where you can get more information. And this was the first time I read about the stampede. And again, I've been doing this work since 1987, but when I read about the stampede, I had to put the book down because I had no idea how horrific it was. So I know that there are some activists here who are coordinating protests, and I asked them for the dates. Saturday, July 6th, they're going to be out there from 12 until 2, and Sunday, they're going to be out there again from 12 until 2. So I really ask you to do what you can in your own community. Um, I know it's one thing to be vegan, but the animals need us to step out of our own comfort zone sometimes and be there and educate other people about what's happening. So. We are a vegan organization, and we are a vegan organization not only because I'm vegan, but also because we believe in the inherent rights of non-human animals to be able to live their lives without fear. Um, what I was mentioning earlier is that I live and I surround myself with a lot of people who love bunnies, so bunnies tend to be the perfect example for me. And the fact that bunnies have the right to their fur without having to worry about somebody wanting to wear it. They have the right to their own flesh without worrying about somebody wanting to consume it. 
and they have the right to not have to worry about cosmetics or other products being tested in, on them. We have the ability in our own ways every single day to lessen suffering in non-human animals, and that is why we are vegan. Not because these animals are somehow intelligent, although we know that fish have now proven to be self-aware, that fish are incredibly intelligent animals, pigs are intelligent animals, but for us, this sheer fact that they can suffer is the reason why we feel that everybody, if you have access to healthy food, should do your part and not consume them. But when we talk about how animals are raised and killed on farms, we also can look further, not only to the suffering in which they endure, but also those who live in the surrounding communities. Um, there are, uh, it's called environmental racism. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that term, but it basically means when one portion, predominantly people of color and in indigenous communities, are more impacted by negative pollutants. So here in Calgary area, it's the Aboriginal, the Blacks, and the low-income communities that have way more toxic dump and waste sites in their areas. So that means that they're living and breathing toxic waste, which is why a lot of people in these communities have higher rates of um, asthma in some areas, but also higher rates of cancer. So when you look at factory farms, it's not much different. California, where our organization is based, is the number one dairy producing state in the United States, where we have some of the highest rates of asthma in the Latinx community. I'm a Chicana, I'm Mexican, I'm very proud Mexican. Um, and so our communities are the most impacted. In North Carolina, it's predominantly indigenous and black communities living there, where they can't even have their windows open in the summertime because the smells are so bad and the toxic waste is so bad from the manure pits nearby. So all of these things are about, right, about non-human animals and how us consuming animals is bad for them, how it's bad for communities. You took a look at slaughterhouse workers and factory farm workers, they too are abused. But it's even more important to me, and I'll try to slow down if I'm talking too fast for you. <laughs> um, and thank you all for organizing this and having a um, sign language interpreter, and it's, as it should be. As vegans, we need to recognize that our food is not absolve us from participating in the suffering of other living beings. Because farm workers are some of the most abused people and exploited people, and they, unless you grow and eat your own food, you have a farm worker to thank for everything you eat. And yet, most of them um, experience wage theft where they don't get paid. They um, live in horrific conditions. They don't have the same benefits of health care, sick days, vacation days. They're exposed to agricultural chemicals on a regular basis. Um, a lot of them, at least where we're based, a lot of them are homeless. They live in cardboard boxes and they live in pickup trucks. And California provides the most produce to people around the world. The average lifespan of a farm worker is 49 years old. To put that in perspective, I'm 49 years old. So you would assume that pretty soon I would be unable to live anymore because of the horrific conditions in which my body is put into to say pick strawberries and because I'm being doused with agricultural chemicals. Here in Canada, um, CBC Alberta um, did a story on Hondurans who were um, living in cramped conditions, um, who were picking produce here. They were living in very moldy houses. Um, and again, this happens for you know one pretty obvious reason, and that's racism. The fact that it seems to be OK to treat people who are seen as um, powerless in such a way. Our organization really wants to remind vegans that we have to be careful about the things that we say. Um, we can't act as if something's cruelty-free just because it's vegan. We have to recognize that we have some responsibility when it comes to farm workers. Um, our organization does a lot of um, policy work as well as legislative work on um, advocating for farm worker justice, but we also support farm worker campaigns that they themselves have called. So we're asking people to honor the boycott
called by the coalition of Immokalee workers to boycott Wendy's. They are refusing to pay one more penny per pound for the tomatoes that the farm workers pick. We ask you on behalf of the San Quintin farm workers in Mexico to boycott Driscoll Berries. Food Empowerment Project, we also organize a school supply drive for the children of farm workers, which is taking place right now. So we are an international organization, so anybody can send us school supplies from around the world. So the other area that is a big part of our work, and this is especially where we're talking about something just because it's vegan not being cruelty free. And that's the fact that 70% of the world's cacao comes from areas where child labor and slavery are the most prevalent. Western Africa and now Brazil are on the list of areas where forced labor and child labor and slavery are taking place. Western Africa having it more, far more prevalent. So how do these children get there? They get there in a variety of ways. One is that, and I wish I had the images to show you all, but all of this is available on our website and we have a table here where we have some information as well. But the children are sometimes sold into it. Um, in the Ivory Coast in Ghana, there's some very poor countries nearby called Mali and Burkina Faso. And this is where um, the children will, their parents think they're gonna get jobs, they believe them, and their children think that they're going to be able to go work and then send the money back to the families. Other times, the children are actually stolen and kidnapped. These children, are traffic, they are trafficked hundreds of miles away to areas where they go to, they don't even speak the local dialect. This is slavery. This is slavery because the children are locked in at night and they cannot escape. This is slavery because they are not being paid. We're talking about children using heavy equipment such as machetes to cut cacao pods out of the trees, which is why so many of them have scars on their arms and their legs. In 2016, six to 16 children were liberated in Western Africa. In 2017, children were being sold for $34 each, all for chocolate all for something that is literally a luxury that is not necessary for anybody. Now, we have a list of chocolate we do and do not recommend to help people make decisions about the chocolate that they buy. We do not go based on certifications. Certifications have been found from Fair Trade to Rainforest Alliance to Oots have all been found to be very problematic. We've never based our list on certifications. However, the Washington Post just came out with an article on June 5th validating our work that there is no, that they basically list all the problems with fair trade and Rainforest Alliance. They're not fully investigating the farms and they're ushering out the children when the investigations take place. So we try to make it easier for you. Um, as a vegan organization, every company that makes our list has to make at least one vegan chocolate and our list contains companies that we recommend and that we don't recommend, and we explain to you why. We're fully transparent about why we don't recommend a company. Now, some companies don't respond to us, including some vegan companies, and some companies claim it's proprietary. Somehow, they think in this day and age, they don't have to tell us if something as simple as where their chocolate's coming from when we're talking about slavery and child labor, which is outrageous. We also made our chocolate list into an app that you can download for free. So um, you can type in the name of the company. It tells you if we recommend it or not. If you also type in the word Canada, it'll pull up every company in Canada. Our list is international. So if you travel overseas, you just type in the name of the company. Sorry, and it'll tell you the list of that country and if we recommend them or not. We update our list every month. So if there's a company you like that is not on our list, you can email us their name and we will reach out to the company and find out if, if they meet our standards or not. So um, one of the other areas we work on when we're talking about food justice, for an organization like ours, food justice starts from the beginning, right? 
It starts from where those farm workers and what they're doing, and it goes all the way to the restaurant workers, the factory, the, the, sorry, the restaurant workers, the grocery store workers, the truck drivers, everybody. We include everybody, right? We want justice for everybody. So we include all of that in our food justice mission. One of the things we also include is the lack of access to healthy foods in black and brown communities. And maybe some of you may or may not have heard of the term, but there's a term called food deserts. So if that helps you put in perspective, these are areas where indigenous people and black and brown communities have higher areas where they have liquor stores, fast food, but they don't necessarily have grocery stores or gardens to grow their own food. This is a phenomenon that takes place around the world. So Canada, in my talks, is no different than New Zealand when I'm talking about the Mori there, or the United States, which is predominantly black and brown communities and the indigenous. So these are also areas where you have higher rates of diabetes, you have higher rates of dietary diseases that are associated with um, cancers and other health problems. So I looked up what's happening here in Calgary and a 2016 article listed downtown Calgary and Edmonton residents um, as ha being, living in what they call food deserts. Now we don't use the term food deserts. Food deserts makes it this kind of simplistic term. Um, sorry, I'm so happy y'all have this. I'm just like in glowing about it. Um, but basically, um, so this is where the, well, and again, one of these reports was done by a university group. But what's happening is it's all over. And it's always our communities, again, as a Mexican, it's very much our communities that are impacted. Um, so what we've done is part of our work, you know, we're a vegan organization, right? We want everybody to go vegan because we don't want the animals to be harmed. But we also know there's outright injustices that are taking place. Racism, again, being one of these that in black and brown communities, we do not have the same access to healthy foods. And there's a variety of reasons for that, right? There's a lot of reasons. Um, so what we do is we actually physically go in and we do assessment on the availability of healthy foods in these communities. We check out the liquor stores, the grocery stores, to see how many fruits and vegetables they have, but also if they have meat and dairy alternatives. And we do that again because we don't want we don't want animals to be harmed, but we also know that we, in all the studies will prove it, that diets higher in fruits and vegetables are better for your health. So why is it in these communities we don't have access to it? We also know that for many of us, our, our lands were colonized. So my ancestors are from Mexico, right? North America, but the southern half. That's where my ancestors are from. And who brought cows and goats to my ancestral land? was Columbus on this fourth voyage. So my ancestors, we do not digest cow milk or goat milk very well, right? That is not, that is not our body. That is not what's native for us. So a lot of people call that lactose intolerance, right? Our concern with that term is that it puts the onus on people of color as if there's something wrong with us, that we don't digest, one, the milk of another species, and two, a colonized food. So we call this lactose normal, because we feel actually we're the normal ones here, because we're not drinking milk from a cow or a goat. So we're trying to remind people to use terms like that to really center this, right? Center what it is, because we are the ones who are normal. We're not drinking cow and goat milk. So when we do our serving, what we found, and again, it's no surprise that um, these areas, the people are familiar with organic. They are familiar with eating produce being good for them. They simply don't have access to it. And one of the biggest barriers we found in our work, why people don't have access to this food, is because of cost. So food deserts make it seem like it's proximity, right? Oh, the grocery store is three miles away. That is obviously an additional burden. But the biggest burden is simply the cost of the food. So what do you do, right? So everybody hopefully is outraged. It sh people should be outraged by the fact that healthy food has become a privilege in this world instead of a right as it should be. But what we can all do is fight for living wages. Fight for those Walmart workers. Fight for those restaurant workers. Fight for every, fight your state, fight your municipality, and make sure everybody's being paid living wages. Because one, being paid living wages creates equity. 
right? We don't want food prices to go down. Farm workers are already getting paid nothing. We want everybody to be lifted up. We want people to be able to buy healthy food for them, for their families to thrive. And the only way they're gonna be able to do that is they can afford it. So we really want everybody to do their part and really advocate for living wages. On our social media, we're all, always posting about living wage efforts that are taking place. Um, in doing our work, we also found that a lot of people in their own countries, because a lot of the work we did included immigrant communities, that they were actually eating healthier in their homelands because they were able to grow their own foods. But instead, and again, I like to bash the United States because you all know why I like to bash the United States. I don't need to explain that. Um, that, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Just thinking of all the stuff I want to say bad about the US, but I cannot do that here. Um, uh, but in the United States, they were forced to buy their food from liquor stores, right? So instead of using fresh tomatoes, they were encouraged to use tomato paste. And they're not going to want to do that. That's not healthy. But that's what they're forced to deal with. Um, we also, in doing our focus group, so what we do is we do the assessment. And one of the problems I think most organizations face when they're working on these issues is that well-intentioned government officials and NGOs think they can go into black and brown communities and start telling them what to do. And that is not what you do. You listen to the communities because they are the ones living it and the ones experiencing it. And so, and so you listen to them what the barriers are. And what we found, again, was living wages and proximity. But what we also found was that a gro there's a grocery store chain you all have here, but it's a little bit separate from the one we have called Safeway. What we found were that grocery stores, let's, I'll give you an example in the community we're working in called Vallejo. It's in between San Francisco and Sacramento, California. And what we found was is that when Safeway was located in downtown, a black and brown community where the elderly were living, where, um, you know, a poor area of town. And what they did is they left that location, moved a few miles away to a more fluent area, and they placed what's called a restrictive deed on their former property, which prevented another grocery store from moving in for 15 years depriving them from ever having a grocery store. They're doing this all over the United States. Our understanding is this is an international thing. We don't, we've tried to figure out how much is happening here in Canada, Canada, but we don't know. But a lot of times, corporations that should be in the business of providing healthy foods are actually preventing people from getting healthy foods. So what we would like to see is people off a system that was never made for them. A capitalist system, hopefully it doesn't scare anybody, but a capitalist system was really never meant to empower the most vulnerable. It'd be ideal for people to grow their own food and be self-sufficient and feel that power of being able to provide for themselves. Someone like me who's only lived in grocery stores, oh, sorry, lived in grocery stores, <laughs> lived in, wouldn't that be cool? Um, I get rid of all the animal products, all the good tests on animals, dream world. Um, but, you know, I've only ever lived in apartments. So having my own, having land to grow has never been an option. So we really believe in worker-owned cooperatives. These are very different than membership-driven cooperatives. These are where the people who live in the community work there, and they're the ones who make the profits. And I'm sure this means my time's running out. Five minutes. OK, so basically, all of this information is on our website, which is foodispower.org, which is fully in English and in Spanish. We also have um, veganmexicanfood.com, which is in English and in Spanish. We're working on um, vegan Filipino food, which will be in English and Tagalog. Um, we have a table if you all are interested. Um, all of this is in there, and I'm just going to give you the quick things on what you can do, right? Number one, so, yeah, I'll back up. Um, if you have access to healthy foods, go vegan. And the reason why we say that is because we get very concerned when vegans say things like, it's easy to go vegan, because it's not for everybody. And what that shows people is we're out of touch. We're either very privileged or we're out of touch. So if you have access to healthy foods, go vegan. And we are trying to help communities that don't have access to healthy foods get that healthy food. Um, lend your voices and echo the needs of farm workers. Support their campaigns. Buy organic when you can. It doesn't mean that the farm workers are treated much better, but they're not being gassed with agricultural chemicals. Please use our chocolate list um, and buy ethical chocolate. Um, Speak out for living wages, 
I'm asking people to speak out against all the injustices. We are on social media. Um, and I just want to leave you with one thought. There's many people, um, our history, at least in the United States, is riddled with incredible historical leaders, um, such as Frederick Douglass, Martin Luther King Jr., and who we still have, the great Dolores Huerta. And these were all people who didn't say one or the other. Frederick Douglass, for our world, is an abolitionist. Have y'all heard of Frederick Douglass? Okay. Isn't that horrible? Y'all like to say some leader in Canada, I'd be like, I don't know who that is, but you all know the U.S. because we're so horrible. But anyway, um, Frederick Douglass fought for the abolition of slavery, right? That's what he did. But he also fought for the women's right to vote. Martin Luther King Jr. fought for civil rights. But when he is, was assassinated is when he started talking about the janitors and the poor people. When he started to recognize it's all connected and it's all on the same path. That's what we're trying to say with what it is that we need to do, society needs to do, but we as a movement more importantly need to do, is recognize that very many of these forms of oppression that take place, that happen to human animals and non-human animals are similar. And we have to be there to help unite these issues. Because if we're gonna force and be a strike for justice, we need to make this connection. And we all can do it with our food choices, we have the opportunity, if you have the privilege of eating every day, you have an opportunity every single day, every single time you eat, to look at everything you put in your mouth as a responsibility, locally and globally, to make a difference for human and non-human animals. So we really encourage all of you to eat your ethics. Thanks. Thank you, Lauren. We will be having a panel discussion at 5.15 right here on the main stage with all of the speakers from today, but we do have time for a few questions right now. If anyone has any questions for Lauren, just introduce yourself and ask your question. Hi, my name's Cass. My name's Cass. Um, I might get the answer in your app, but you mentioned the cacao. When I leave here, I'm actually going to Bulk Barn. I don't know if you're familiar with Bulk Barn. That's where I buy my cacao. So I'm curious if you know, so the chocolate bars are on the list, I think the chocolate is yeah. on the list, but can it, would grocery stores also be on the list? Like where can I buy organic cacao? It's not about organic cacao, but what you would do is you would ask them who supplies their, the, who supplies their chocolate. And you can see if that chocolate company is on our list or not. If they're not on our list, then you can give us the name of their chocolate supplier and we will contact the company for you. Because it's hard to find out, because that, that's why we created the list, right? Because the packages do not tell us country of origin. So we created the list to make it easier. So that would be the best way. Unless, I mean, unless they can tell you, but most don't say where their cacao actually comes from. Question over here, I'll run back. Just wondering, do you have a list of uh, all vegetarian grocery stores, like grocery stores that don't sell meat? Um, we're based in the US, so I know grocery stores there that don't sell animal products, but I don't know any here. I think there may be a vegan store here, I'm not familiar. But we do have lists on our website for wine, bananas, coffee, coffee, yeah, and then chocolate. Question over here. Thanks for your talk, it was awesome. Um, so I'm a, a good little socialist. And so um, my question is, I love how you tie together the uh, experience of animals being killed for us or for people who choose to consume those products, um, as well as the experience of workers throughout the entire supply chain, touching on fair trade and whether that's good or bad, and a lot of times it's not. Um, but do you have resources for workers to unionize so that they can control their workplace? Because I work for a, a member-owned co-op and there's a lot of issues that I have with that because as a worker, we don't get, like our say is very diluted in, in how it works. So do you have resources or help people to um, create that power for themselves in the workplace? Um, I wish we did, but there's a fantastic book, which if you email me, I can tell you the name of it, but it's basically about um, black, how the black um, worker-owned cooperatives started. 
because we it was very new to us to learn the difference and we knew we wanted worker owned and found out that the white people in the community wanted member owned and wanted all the brown and black people to work for them. Um, so yeah, uh, but I can give you the name of that book, but um, I don't really know. We usually refer people out to other organizations. We work very closely with the North Bay Organizing Project and all the union groups, but so that's not our area of expertise, but I could definitely pass you along. And that book is fantastic, so. We have time for one more. Make me jog. <laughs> Hi, you started with talking about the Calgary Stampede. Um, we're organizing some protests, Calgary Stampede protest at gmail.com. If anyone's interested in helping, there's gonna be lots of opportunities for some direct activism. Calgary Stampede protest, gmail.com. Thank you. Did you have a question? Thank you for sharing. So everyone will be back at 5.15. We'll take a little break here. Our next speaker is YouTuber Mexi at 4.15, but one final round of applause for lovely Lauren here from California.